Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits I have a minor sock disaster and repair to share, along with some information on knee sock construction. I'll also talk through two options for my upcoming 1970s sweater design, which is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So let's get started. This tidbit comes from I don't actually know where, somewhere. I think someone sent this link to me directly or I saw it on Twitter. But regardless, there was a thread started in my Ravelry group about this tidbit after I first got it. So Miranda, (laughs) if you sent this to me directly somehow, thank you. If not, thanks for posting about it in my Ravelry group. So it's a video on prehistoric splicing fibers. So what does that mean? Well, we know that in order to create yarn, that we have to twist fibers together. If you have two strands of twisted fibers that you twist together in the opposite direction of the original twist, you can make a two-ply yarn or cord or string of some sort. So we've seen evidence of what is called cordage imprinted in the clay of ancient pottery. So this this cordage would have maybe been uh, used as a handle or something for carrying the pottery, but we can see evidence of it. Uh, The link that I'm going to leave down in my show notes is a video from Sally Pointer, and it shows how ancient people may have created cordage through this technique of splicing. So it's quite different from if you know how to spin, it's different from what you would be doing with a spindle or certainly what you would be doing differently from a spinning wheel. So I found it really interesting. Sally's entire channel has got so many cool things on it. And so I'll link to not just the video about uh, the prehistoric splicing, but also just a a link to her actual channel. So I, I feel like I have heard of her, but I wasn't quite sure on her channel page. It says that Sally is a heritage educator, researcher, maker, and demonstrator of traditional skills based in the UK and works with museums and heritage organizations worldwide to promote an understanding of the past through hands-on experience. So uh, I really encourage you to take a look at, if not this particular video, any of the other many, many videos that she has on her channel. This next tidbit is about one of my personal knitting heroes, Barbara G. Walker. So if you're not sure who Barbara Walker is, she is a woman who in the 1970s, I think the first one was published in 1969, but throughout the 1970s, she published a number of stitch dictionaries that were known as treasuries. So treasury of knitting patterns. This is the second treasury. She also uh, created a whole charting system um, that for, especially for uh, cables, that we still use those symbols today, even though the way she created them was with graph paper and pencil. Uh, She also wrote a book called Knitting from the Top. So a lot of the top-down seamless knitting ideas that people use today come from Barbara Walker's uh, innovative work in this book. So between Barbara Walker and Elizabeth Zimmerman, that those two women together in the 1970s really changed the course of the way that we knit today. Both of those women continue to influence designers. The reason I'm bringing up Barbara Walker is that there was recently a thread started in the Loose Ends Forum on Ravelry, and it was uh, the thread was started by Barbara Walker's son. So Barbara is still alive. She is 92. Apparently she hasn't knit in a number of years. Uh, her life was just full of research and books of all sorts, not just knitting. 
but he sort of gave an update on how she's doing currently and what's going on with her life. So if she is a hero of yours or if you have only just uh, recently discovered her but uh, find her work really invaluable, I'd encourage you to, uh, to read that thread. It's uh, really amazing. Um, I will leave a link to that down in the show notes. Now, I do know where this tidbit came from. It's from So Grumpy Grandma on Ravelry, and uh, she shared a YouTube video from Rob Stevens' channel called Flax to Linen from Sewing to Sewing. So flax is a plant fiber that after it has been processed and spun into yarn and then woven or knitted into fabric, then it's called linen. So this is one of those situations where I watched the entire process and I just have to marvel at the ancient human's abilities to figure this stuff out, like how to take that plant and what needs to be done to it to transform it into something that can then be turned into yarn and which can then be turned into clothing or fabric or, or something else. So I will leave a, a link to that video down in the show notes. I, I again, I just marvel at, at what humans have been able to figure out and what they figured out back in the days when they had very limited tools. This tidbit came to me from Syntosis and it is an Eventbrite event from Anti University and it's called Knitting the Uncanny with Rosina Godwin. It's part of the Anti-University Festival from the 10th to 16th of September. And the description for this event is as follows, and I'll also leave links down in the show notes. The workshop unpicks the nurturing associations of knitting to explore the uncanny, a condition described by Sigmund Freud as when something unknown appears strangely familiar while an everyday object or habit seems alien and unsettling. Focusing on combining knitting with fabric and other found objects, the session aims to rethink the Women's Craft Association of Knitting. Participants will be able to build their own personal narratives uh, with mistakes are celebrated as part of the artistic process. So you'll be creating simple three-dimensional forms through both knitting and soft sculpture, combining contrasting states, soft, hard, cozy, discomfort, life, death, incorporating found objects. The workshop is aimed at anyone with an interest in textiles and sculpture and is suitable for all abilities, although knitting or crochet skills would be an advantage. So it's free and the event is on Saturday, the 10th of September from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. British summertime. So if you live here in the U.S., that translates to very early in the morning, 5 a.m. on the East Coast and a 2 a.m. start on the West Coast. And again, all of the links to everything I've talked about in the tidbits are down in the show notes. So I was on vacation last week. We took a road trip to Michigan to see my family. So I left my reverse engineered sweater at home and took along a sock project for knitting in the car. So while I was sitting in my brother's kitchen, I pulled on the first sock of the pair. It's, it's a sock that I knit back at the end of March of this year because uh, I wanted to show it off to him. And he said, oh, there's a hole on one side of the sock. And I, I had noticed the hole before, but because I was knitting a contrast heels in the sock, I told him, oh, that's just where I joined the contrast yarn. And that once I wove the tails, yarn tails in, the hole would close up. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so then I looked at it later and I realized, oh no, there, there was in fact a hole in the sock. One of the stitches at the corner of the heel had dropped down multiple rows. So I put it on a locking stitch marker so that it wouldn't get any worse. And then I shoved it back into my project bag until we got home. So I'm well on my way through the second sock of the pair uh, without having fixed the problem with that first sock. So I, what I thought I'd do is go to the overhead and show you guys how I approached uh, fixing something like that. 
I have an orange marker around the stitch that is live. Uh, what had happened was this stitch isn't connected. I think it was at the corner where I'd done the contrast yarn and it could be that I was working some stitches together or something like that and then one of them uh, they didn't actually get knit together and so one fell off. I, you know, I, that's my guess. This stitch had dropped down several rows. So I used a crochet hook to bring it back up. So I want to connect it in a way that won't be super obvious. Now the best way to do that would be if I had some of this color yarn and I could use duplicate stitch which is tracing the path of stitches along a row until I got to this one and then I could use that uh, to connect this live stitch to uh, this one right here. You can see there's the bright purple yarn here. That's why I think, I think I was working some stitches together and one of them fell off. So there is a stitch here. It's just not, not the stitch <laughs> that, uh, that I need there. So I don't have access to any of this yarn in order to hide that result, but what I do have is the contrast yarn tail that I joined to the sock. I mean, that there is, there's a little hole here anyway because that's where I joined the yarn tail and so it would need to get kind of cinched up anyway. So what I'm going to do is use that yarn tail to rejoin this stitch. So I can kind of see the yarn right here that was probably supposed to be attached to that stitch and, and then didn't get attached. Uh, but here's the yarn tail. So I'm going to thread my needle and I'm going to poke this through that hole right now. So I'm just going to poke that through, turn the sock inside out again. So I want to orient the stitch so that it isn't twisted. And I'm just going to do this. I'm going to come through this stitch from behind like that. Come through the center of the stitch from behind, bring that yarn through and then I'm going to attach it around the base of that stitch. So this is uh, kind of what duplicate stitch is. Um, so I need to go back down through that original stitch and I'm going to come up through uh, the center of the next stitch here just to connect it. So you can see I've got a different color there. It's a different color than the other ones because this is the yarn I have available, but it's right in that corner. So I don't think it'll be too uh, noticeable. So now I'm going to go back down through that hole right there, turn it inside out again. And, and now I can look to see if, well, there's still a little bit um, of a, a gap right there. And I can use my yarn tail to cinch up around that gap going through a purl bumps. This is something I would normally do anyway. Um, around a hole like that, something so that I've, I've closed up that hole and now I can actually weave my yarn tail in. So I have videos on correcting holes like the one that I showed you. There's different scenarios like if you drop a stitch or if you accidentally create a new column of stitches or if you, um, you know, different scenarios for that. So I will link to that video and I will also um, link to a video on this technique that I'm using you, because there's no way you can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, but I'm, I'm following the path of the stitches in this row in order to weave in the yarn tails and that will allow the tail to stretch along with the fabric and it will keep the tail from popping through uh, to the front. But that's the technique I use to actually weave in yarn tails. Um, but uh, this technique of cinching around the hole is, is one I commonly use um, when I'm weaving in tails at places where things have been joined together like that. And then uh, closing that hole is kind of a variation on uh, a technique that I have in another video as well. So I'll put all of those links down in the show notes in the section about my knee high. So as I mentioned, I have a video on fixing holes in your knitting, which I'll link to uh, down in the show notes, and the method that I use to weave in my yarn tail along the path of a row of knitting. That's called reverse duplicate stitch, and I'll leave links to those down in the show notes. Uh, I think it's really important 
to, uh, to show you guys when I have made mistakes, because I do make mistakes. A lot of people think that uh, when you become a really proficient knitter, then somehow miraculously you stop making mistakes and that does not happen. Uh, and I just have gotten very good at fixing mistakes because I've had a lot of practice because I make a lot of mistakes. So I, I just like to show you guys when things like that go wrong in a project and show you that there's actually usually a pretty easy fix to something like that. So now I wanna go back to the overhead and talk a little bit about my approach uh, to knitting knee socks and how I do the shaping on that. I've mentioned before how I do the shaping for a knee sock. I've just given a brief overview uh, on a casual Friday and people have asked me about this. I have not done a Technique Tuesday video on this, but I'm going to go through the concept uh, a little bit, maybe more step by step. Uh, at some point, I probably will do a Technique Tuesday video on it. Uh, but so far, I've only knit uh, knee socks for myself, and I haven't knit uh, knee socks for uh, people with other uh, shaped legs. But based on a, a lot of knee sock patterns and books and things that uh, I've read, this seems to be a reasonable approach. The idea for a normal sock that might end like right here is that you are using the same circumference for the sock for the entire leg and you have 10% negative ease down here. Um, but you, the negative ease gets, gets more and more as it's going up the leg. So I have an eight inch circumference leg. I make my socks seven inches in circumference and the, the place where a regular sock would end right here, my leg is 10 and a half inches in circumference. So that means my seven inch sock leg has to stretch to fit a 10 and a half inch leg. And that is not really a problem. The, the bigger challenge is getting it to fit past my heel because that's more than 12 inches. So I have to make sure my cast on is nice and stretchy so that I can get that past my heel. Um, so, so this is very comfortable for me, but you know, that's like 50% negative ease up around here. If I want to extend the sock up my leg, I don't want that much negative ease around in the entire leg. That amount of negative ease helps keep the sock from falling down. Um, but the sock is going to be much bigger. It's coming up all the way up to here. And so there's an adjustment that's made. So based on things I've read and based on seeing that this is true for my own leg, I have determined that about six inches from where the heel turn is, so at the base of your heel at the floor, if you, if you go up six inches, so if you add the, the height of your heel and then however much sock leg you need uh, to knit to make this six inches, uh, which would be like 15 centimeters, um, that's a good point to start your increases. You want to end the increases at the point where your leg is a little, the largest. And the idea is to maintain about 25, 20 to 25% negative ease. Um, so based on the measurement of my calf, 25% negative ease for me would be, um, about 10 and a half inches I need my sock to be around in order to fit snugly around here. My gauge is eight stitches per inch, so I need about 85 stitches. I have an even number of stitches. I'm increasing in pairs, so 84 stitches is, is going to work. So I'm starting with 56 stitches down here. I wanna start my increases six inches from the floor and I want to end them up here. Well, I have to know how long this actually is, and I think it's about five and a half or six inches long, something like that, um, that this, this length right here. So I need to go from 56 stitches to 84 stitches, doing two at a time, so that's 14 sets of increases. The first one is right at the zero mark, and the last one is at the whatever it is, five and a half or six inches mark. So I figure out how many rows do I have? Use my row gauge. How many rows is this going to be? And then how can I divide it evenly amongst those 14 sets of increases? So for me, it came out to be every five increases or every five rounds, I needed to do uh, a pair of increases.
So I did my first set here, and then so that's round one, and then round six, round 11, round uh, 16, et cetera, all the way up uh, until I get all of them done here. And then I just worked straight until I it was as long as I wanted it to be. Uh, and I have played around with how, you know, how tight does this need to be at the top um, in order for the socks to stay up because many people, not everybody, but a lot of people, your leg gets smaller up here than it is down here where the calf muscle is. And that's true for me, but because I like to have the fold over cuff, this creates a little bit more snugness because this this is the same circumference as this is, so it has to stretch even more on the outside of the sock. So that's what works for me. Um, and this wasn't at toe up. That works really, really well for trying on a, uh, a knee sock like this and seeing if your increases are working. But the real reason <laughs> that I knit toe up was because I had the self-striping yarn and a contrasting. Um, mini skein for the heels and so I wanted to use all of the yarn. This is like one of the very very few times I've ever wanted to use every bit of yarn because if I am knitting socks to here I have so much left over there's just not a way to use all of it and end at a, at a good place. So the 100 grams of the self-striping yarn plus the whatever it was 20-25 grams of the contrast was enough for me to create a sock, a knee sock for for my leg that where I could actually fold um, the top over. That's the general process and, and what I'm looking for in terms of um, negative ease percentages and how I'm um, figuring out how to um, space the increases as I go up the leg. As most of you probably know, and I also mentioned it in the intro, I've been working on a long-term project for about the past three and a half years uh, to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So I've made it all the way up through the 1960s and I'm currently in the planning stages of the 1970s sweater. And that one is, is going to be self-designed using sort of the in general instructions from Elizabeth Zimmerman's book, uh, Knitting Without Tears. Her knitting patterns are more like a conversation, uh, like a talk through, here's how you go, go through this. It's not a conventional pattern in the way we tend to, uh, to think of them. So what I wanted to do, I've got a couple of schematics that I have drawn up uh, for ideas, and I thought I would show those to you because they're quite different from each other. Um, and I think you might find, find that interesting. So let's go to the overhead. I have quite a few Elizabeth Zimmerman books. Uh, the two that I have been referring to up to this point has, have been Knitting Without Tears, which was published in 1971. And then The Opinionated Knitter which is a compilation of the newsletters that she published between 1958 and 1968. The book itself was published in 2005. So there's information in this book that I am not clear about in terms of when those ideas would have been introduced to knitters who, who may have been exposed to Elizabeth Zimmerman in ways other than um, Knitting Without Tears or her newsletters. For example, in 1974, she started what is called, I think, Knitting Camp. When Knitting Camp first started in 1974, it was a one-week extension course that was held at one of the branches of the University of Wisconsin, pr probably whichever one was closest to where uh, they lived. So there were a number of years uh, after she published this book where she had these camps. And then in 1981, she published another book called Knitter's Workshop and that was also turned into a PBS series. So they were kind of companion, companions. But again, that was 1981. My assumption is that the book that was published in 1981 was probably based on the stuff that she was teaching in the 70s to people who came to her camp. But I don't know for sure. 
So I've written to Schoolhouse Press, which is her company, her daughter Meg still runs, in order to find out about information. So the original, one of the very first newsletters that Elizabeth Zimmerman wrote back in 1958 was the pattern for this sweater that I'm interested in knitting from the 1970s. So between 1958 and 1971, when she wrote Knitting Without Tears, she added some extra information in the book about things that you could do or modifications you could make. But in this book, which again, it was published in 2005 and was based on her popular newsletters, there is an additional page of information, which is based on EPS, which is Elizabeth's percentage system. And it's not clear to me when the, this abbreviation became popular. She was using the concepts of her percentage system throughout these years. She was using these concepts. The thing that I noticed in this image was that there was a drop shoulder option, but there was also a modified drop shoulder option. And this is the one that I am really interested in. I just don't know when she first developed it and when, when knitters would have, have learned about this because uh, Elizabeth's daughter, Meg Swanson, also is a designer and again runs the Schoolhouse Press business. So the percentage system is based on determining how what circumference you want for your sweater and then other things are based on a percentage of that body circumference. So I wanted to show you kind of my little sketchbook. So this is this is the idea that I originally had using this ski sweater and the information I was finding in the Opinionated Knitter. And what I realized as I was going along is that a lot of what I was doing was just based on my own experience and understanding my own body and how I, how I like things to fit, which is certainly part of Elizabeth's um, goal is for knitters to understand what they like and how they like things to fit. But I wasn't convinced that some of the things that I wanted to do, if I were say an average knitter in the 1970s and I was looking for Elizabeth's books and publications or camps to guide me, I'm not sure that I would have come to this conclusion. So. Uh, I went back to Knitting Without Tears and I'm rereading the instructions. And I'm thinking that even though I know that there might be some issues that I could have with the way that this fits, I kind of want to just do that. It's, it's, it's a, a system that she, she was, had, had been developing by 1971, she had refined things to, from her 1958 version. And I kind of want to just see how well this works. And you can see that the silhouette is very basic. And the idea is, again, you figure out what you want your circumference uh, to be. You find a sweater that you like the fit of and you figure out how big that circumference is. So I kind of know what I want in a sweater circumference that has a little bit of room, but not too much room. And what I want is something that is 38 inches in circumference, which means that it's 19 inches across. So the idea behind this is to just cast on and begin knitting and stockinette and, and start your patterns. And you just go until it's the length that you want it. <laughs> and then you stop and you go back and you do the sleeves. And her idea was that, again, you just cast on and stockinette. There's no ribbing, nothing like that. You start with 20% of whatever the body measurement was. And so you use the ga your gauge to establish what that 20% is. And then her instructions are to increase two stitches every four rows. And to keep doing that until you have the length that you need in your sleeve. 
So, and the way you know that your sleeve is long enough is you measure yourself from wrist up to the back of your neck and all the way back down to your wrist again, your arms out to your side slightly. And that that's the total length that you want for um, the width of your sweater plus the two sleeves. So I know that my wrist to wrist measurement, it's somewhere between 53 and a half and 54 inches. So a half an inch difference is going to make a quarter of an inch at the wrist, which could just be one, a single row of knitting. Like you, you can't get that exact. So I know my wrist to wrist measurement is 54 inches. And if this is 19 inches across, 54 inches minus 19 inches is 35 inches. That means the two sleeve lengths combined are 35 inches. So each sleeve needs to be 17 and a half inches. So if I were to do what she said, and I cast on 20% of this, and then I increase two stitches every four rows, by the time the sleeve is my, the length I want, which is 17 and a half inches, her idea is that it's going to be about the same width as the sweater or 50% of the circumference. And so the idea is that once you have actually knit your sleeve, um, to the length that it needs to be, then you can you can figure out what that measurement is, and then you can cut your armholes based on that measurement. So you cut your armholes, and then you join the the tops of the shoulders about a third for each to create the neck opening, um, and then she has a process for. Um, sewing in the, the sleeve into um, the armhole and then dealing with all of the little um, uh, ends of the wool and how to steam it and then how to tack it all down. So it's a, it's a fairly simple process in many ways. Very, very simple shaping. And then at the end, you come back to the hem and you pick up stitches all the way around, one for one, all the way around. And then you work, uh, you decrease it by, I don't know if it's 10 or 20%. So her idea was that the inside is going to be smaller in circumference. Um, and then you knit that for a few inches. And you could have patterning, you could have a contrast or whatever for that hem that you then uh, sew down to the inside. So her idea is as you're, you're knitting the body of the sweater, you're thinking about what do I want to do for my hems? And then you come back to your sleeve and you do the same sort of thing where you pick up stitches and then you reduce the, uh, the stitch count in order to create the, the facing on the inside. Now, you don't have to do that. You could do ribbing if you wanted, but I, I think it's an interesting idea. So there's a couple of things that I'm interested in trying, and this it certainly is the, a, the absolute simplest possible shape sweater. In Knitting Without Tears, she does have an interesting idea for um, the neck that I might be willing to try. So I'm kind of torn between uh, this very simple concept and seeing if those percentages uh, work for me today. I'm interested in trying this hem idea. I'm interested in, in doing the steaks right here. Uh, the idea that I had been uh, thinking about for my own sweater was, oh, well, I, would, I prefer a modified drop shoulder and I'd want to do uh, shoulder shaping and I'd want a crew neck. And so I'd have sticking things that I would be setting up for the armholes and the neck. And then I'd have, I want a cardigan. So I do, so I was like, oh, I'm making this so much more complicated. And it isn't that I couldn't do this or wouldn't want to do this at some point. It's that I think what, what might be most appropriate would be just to go with what she's got in the book. Like here's learning how to do this for the first time. It isn't that I don't know how to design a sweater. It's that I want to see the process of her leading somebody who would be new to this. And some of these things are new to me. I haven't tried doing things in that particular way before. And I think that could be really interesting. And it's certainly an improvement over the typical 1970s sweaters, which are, you know, in garish colors and acrylic yarn and, you know, just, just kind of awful where these would be in, you know, classic stranded color work um, motifs that um, that could look really nice. 
So I'm kind of leaning toward this, but I'd be interested to hear what you guys think if I should go for the what what she originally had in Knitting Without Tears, which was a, a refinement of her 1958 original design, or should I go for something more ambitious that might not actually reflect what a knitter in the 1970s who is new to, to designing something for herself or himself um, might have tried for the first time. So I, again, I'm leaning more and more toward this because I just really am interested in some of these percentages that she's talking about and seeing how well um, they work for me um, in terms of the amount of ease that I like uh, and and what would work for my body. So let me know what you guys think because I haven't I haven't settled on anything here, but I did want to kind of show you what my ideas were. I've already had a few suggestions for my 1980s sweater. I learned to knit in 1986, so my and and all I ever knit was sweaters until about 2005. I don't have I didn't think that I had anything that I had knit from the 1980s still in my possession um, but I did believe that I had something I'd knit in the very early 90s that I was going to use to represent the 90s but it turns out that early 90s sweater that I knit was actually designed and published in the 1980s it was uh, a sweater from this book called Sasha Kagan's Big and Little Sweater she's a, a Welsh a designer which did a lot of intarsia designs and um, using a lot of Rowan yarns and I actually found a kit for the sweater that I uh, loved that was from this book. I found happened to find a kit for that sweater uh, or probably in 1989 or 90 and I knit it up. So it is a sweater I still wear occasionally. So I do think I have the 1980s covered. The only other sweater from around that time period that I have is an Aran sweater that's kind of getting ratty at the uh, cuffs and I've over dyed it twice because it got stained. So it turns out I really didn't knit that many sweaters for myself in the 1990s because that was when I got married and had kids. My friends were getting married and having kids. So I mostly knit little tiny sweaters in the 1990s and I don't have much uh, left or uh, anything. I, I didn't really have anything that I had knit uh, for myself. So it is possible that I will actually end up knitting a 1990s sweater. Uh, we'll have to see. But for sure, I'm going to be doing the 1970s sweater and I've got the 1980s covered and then we'll see what happens with the 1990s. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.